We've been increasing the number of people on, on these medications. 13% of the New Zealand population is on antidepressant, and we still have rising rates of mental illness. At po- some point, you kind of go, if this treatment was working so well, our rates of mental illness by now should be going down. Welcome to the Flippin' Health Podcast, where we turn medicine on its head, flip it upside down, shake it all about, and see what comes out. We're going to challenge convention and change medicine for the better. Hello, I'm Grant Schofield. And I'm George Henderson. Welcome to the Flippin' Health Podcast. Okay, I'm here with... Julia Rutledge. Can you tell me, Julia, who you are and what you do? Sure. I'm a professor of clinical psychology, and for the last 10 years, I've been doing research uh, looking at the interface between nutrition and mental illness using micronutrients as the way to test and, and look at the relationship between the two. So that's not common though, right? Because when have psychologists started doing nutrition and should they be? <laughs> right. Um, pretty uncommon actually, <laughs> Grant, uh, that you'd find a psychologist who is interested in nutrition. But I, I actually think that it should be part of the core training of psychologists because it's such an important component or piece of the jigsaw puzzle in terms of good health and good well-being. Um, But you won't find a lot of psychologists, I don't think, who have really taken that seriously. Is is there any training in in, in a a psychology qualification at the moment? Goodness, no. Well, unless you get training here at Canterbury, you'll get a little bit from me, but that's about it. I don't think you'll get anyone, any from other universities. And I think it's because psychologists would feel that it was outside of their realm of expertise, partially to talk about diet. Whereas I think there's some very basic principles that you can stick to where you really can't go wrong around um, dietary advice to your clients. Yeah. And so how did you even get into that then? Because you were, you were being a psychologist and training yes, psychologist and yeah. you weren't doing nutrition. How did that step yes. happen? Yes. Um, okay, so are you ready? It's a long story. Do we're you want ready. a long story? No, we're ready. Okay, all right. <laughs> you got, you're holding your mic. I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Um, so how did this happen? So I, I went through a, a very traditional clinical psychology training program at the University of Calgary, um, master's and PhD. I did a very tra- sort of a very conventional, safe, um, well, not probably safe at the time, but uh, standard PhD looked at the effects of, not the effects, I looked at um, the outcomes for women who were struggling with ADHD. That was my, my PhD. Um, and but at the time when I was doing my PhD, my supervisor, my PhD supervisor, Professor Bonnie Kaplan, was approached by some families from southern Alberta, Canada, which was um, you know maybe a couple of hours outside of Calgary, who were treating their family members with nutrients and nutrients in pill form is what I mean there. And so they just started doing that on their own. They did. It's a long story around how they ended up doing that, but essentially, they were. Um, they they had n- no knowledge of nutrition. Uh, well, actually, that's unfair. No knowledge of nutrients with respect to human health. Um, but what they did know a lot about was the experience of having uh, children who were struggling with mental health issues and not getting well treated by the current conventional model, which was a lot of medications. So the sort of just take a step back is that one of the family members, Tony Stephan, uh, Tony Stephan he's a father of, um, I think there's 12 children. They're, he's a, they're Mormon, Mormon families, so they have very lar- large, um, large, uh, a <laughs> lot of children. Um, and Tony Stephan's wife had killed herself, committed suicide. Oh, right. And she had bipolar disorder, and her father had bipolar disorder, and he had killed himself. And, and he was concerned the kids were going to go down Exactly, this yeah. So he, was con- he had four children who had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and they'd been in and out of, uh, of mental health facilities and more and more drugs and more and more problems, and he, just, he could see the train wreck ahead of him. So he happened to be speaking to another man who lived in his community, a guy called David Hardy, and David said to him, well, you know, I don't know anything about these problems that you're describing your children. But what I do know is that when pigs get very um, irritable and they start to bite each other and they bite their tails and they bite their ears of each other. Pig fights. 
what's that? Pig fights. Pig fights. I yeah. you probably, but they, it's got a name. It's called. I think it's called. Um, it's called ear and. Um, tail biting syndrome. Oh. Okay, yes. Oh, it's an actual yes, syndrome. Yes, it's an actual syndrome it, with pigs. Yeah. So they um, treat it with broad spectrum of micronutrients. And ah. so they and give... And it resolves it. And it resolves it. And so he said, you know, what you're describing your kids kind of sounds like this irritability, irritability that we see in pigs. I know. Yeah, amazing. Animal nutrition being relevant to human nutrition. Yep. So... Um, so Tony thought, well, I have nothing better, to, you know, there's there's nothing else that, you know, the, the psychiatrist can offer me. And why don't we experiment with using these nutrients that you use with animals and use it with the children, his children. So they were, you know, I can't, I think they were between 16 and, you know, in the early 20s. Yep. So um, they essentially did a shift from the medis- medical approach to using the nutrients. And of course, their children got better because otherwise I wouldn't be here telling you this story. Yeah. And um, they are now continuing to do well 30-odd years later. So this was wow. in the mid-1990s that this happened. And wh- where did they get the – these are just off the shelf? They – no, not exactly. They, they're they not um, researchers, but they – David has he teaches he taught he's he he passed away a couple of years ago but he taught um science in high school so he had a bit of a knowledge mm. of science and how to how to try to run things and so he um they read all the studies that have been done on using nutrients for the treatment of mental illness and they they use that information they use the information they knew from the animal literature and they came up with a formula to give to the kids and they've they've worked on it has changed over time and um you know they've 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 adjusted the doses but they there's a lot that we already know about the balance of different nutrients and so they use that knowledge in terms of developing the nutrients mm. combination that they used with their kids and they um yeah that's that was that's sort of the beginning of the nutrients that that we've been studying but they they found the kids got better and then they they lived in a small community and so everyone heard about it, as you can well imagine, and word of mouth spread. And everyone wanted to try the nutrients, and they were grinding it in their basement and just giving it out to whoever wanted them. Yep. And um, what happened over time was that they decided that they wanted to get it researched. They knew they could just sell it, yeah. um, but they... Thought they'd do the right thing. They thought they wanted to do the right thing, and so they approached many scientists in the local area, of which Bonnie Kaplan was one of them. So she initially said, well, you take the, that snake oil and you go somewhere else. Yeah, I just right. don't want to have anything to do with this. But they they collected, they persisted, and they collected data, and they sent it to Bonnie and they and showed this really quite remarkable and consistent effect of people's mood getting better. Huh. And so she decided to study it. And uh, this was, as I said, around the time when I was just finishing off my PhD. So I kind of was like, what in the world is Bonnie doing? But I think one thing that's really important that all scientists should have is a curiosity. I about could, could not agree more. Yes, a curiosity um, that is that if something comes along that is completely against the worldview, that we have, it's our role to not dismiss it. In fact, to be even more curious about it. We should be curious about it, exactly. And so we are supposedly the critics and conscience of society, and I take that part of it very, very seriously, that we have to study things even if it contravenes the current way of thinking. And that, of course, matches very well with what you've done around challenging the idea that we should all be eating low fat, and we know that that hasn't worked. Yeah. So it's that same concept of we, we've we got to put it to the test. So here are these, these families claiming to have found a treatment for mental illness. Yeah. You rather than, and, and we're not talking about just minor we're depression. About we're talking about serious, serious psychi- disorder. exactly serious psychiatric conditions that I had been taught could only ever be treated with medication, um, with serious side effects. With serious side effects, absolutely. And um, here they were. That that is our role. That we can we have the tools and the um, knowledge on how to test it. We know how to do that. We know how to do a randomized control trial. And so. Um, so Bonnie decided to do a, a small open label trial uh, back in the late 1990s, found remarkable effects of the nutrients on reduction of the symptoms associated with bipolar disorder alongside a reduction in medication use. So really yeah, an, a, yeah, a, a yeah, p- wow. really positive outcome. And she set up a randomized control trial and then um, uh, 
they st- they got it going um, and they got some funding and then they published is something it was they published this a while ago so I don't know I can't remember all the details but they published the the f- initial findings and she presented it at the Canadian Psychiatric Association conference and it got some media attention and then within weeks their trial was shut down. And is there some conspiracy around this? There, well, I don't know if it's a conspiracy, but it's well known that Health Canada, which is the equivalent of our far, no, it wouldn't be pharma, it would be like MedSafe, mm-hmm. um, does get funding from the pharmaceutical industry. That's it. That's a known, that's not a conspiracy. Yeah. So did that have it play a role? I don't know. But it's curious that they were shut down. And the and and the company was told to stop selling the nutrients in Canada. Wow. Yeah. So it was a pretty dire time and a bla- and they and they were fined and there was a big court case and they won eventually. But it was it shut down the research in Canada for five or six years. And by the time she finally was allowed to get going again, there was so much negative publicity that she could never actually continue to go do the randomized control trial that she had started. Wow. So meanwhile, she was trying to find other people to do the research. And so I, by this point, I'd moved to New Zealand. And um, and I thought, well, how hard can it be? What's the big deal? It's just nutrients, <laughs> right? Yeah. Everyone takes them. Yeah. It's our job to, to they're, determine. They're, they're, they're legal. They're, they're they legal. have no, no serious side effects. Exactly. So, so what's the big deal to just t- to test it? And that's when I started to learn about how much opposition there is to doing something radical, like using nutrients. And did to, that surprise you? It did. Totally did. But that is probably because I walked into it as a very naive researcher and just thinking positively about the whole world yeah, right. and how we, you know, everyone, we're just going to make a difference. And, and, you're, and I was in, you know, that early stage of my career where um, you think that you're still optimistic yeah. <laughs> I think, and, you th- and you think your treatments work and all of those things but that didn't take long to realize that they, you know the treatments aren't as good as we thought they were so it just it made sense to test it no one else was doing it she couldn't do it in Canada so we, um, I tried to get that kind of research going here. It took a long time to get it through ethics. I had every opposition, never have been able to get it funded properly, mm-hmm. ever. Um, number one thing is that we've never accepted or, or been offered, if in all fairness to the companies that make these products, um, any any money to fund mm. the, the the research that we've been doing. Yeah, which is because they actually aren't pharmaceuticals. They're just in competition with pharmaceuticals. It, that's yeah. right. But, I mean, they could they could fund it. But the, pr- the, the problem is – well, not the problem, but what's happening alongside all of this is that we've had this recognition that the – Data that we've coll- that has been collected through drug company trials is tainted. Yeah. It's not published properly. They change their primary outcome measures. They, they, they don't publish negative trials. So there's they, they all have run of that. Periods to eliminate people with serious side effects. And you yeah, don't know exactly. So stuff, yeah. and that's all been uncovered wonderfully over the last, I would say, 10, 10 years would probably mm. be about right. So um, that like people like Ben Goldacre writing Big yeah, Pharma yeah, yeah. that really opened a, a, your mind eyes to mm-hmm. oh my god I didn't realize how corrupt it's been so so all of all of that's happening as so you can see that for us it is absolutely essential that we don't get any money from mm, the companies that make yeah. the product so that I can you know hand on heart I can say even though I've had this investigated repeatedly people have I have done uh, official information acts on all of my funds that I get mm-hmm. um, in order to try to uncover the dirt they haven't been successful because it doesn't exactly. exist right. it's not there so um, but it just it's a it's so it's it's time consuming when you get one of those and emotionally hard. Yeah, oh, very emotionally hard. It's like, why is this happening? All I'm doing because you're is you're challenging time. convention. Do you, do you, do you know that? I do know that. Yeah. I figured that one out. Yeah, yes. yeah. It, yeah I, I'm less naive than I was. I, nothing surprises me now. And uh, and so the there's a whole field now called nutritional psychiatry or nutritional psychology. Mm-hmm. There's sort of a couple of names which mm-hmm. I think you've sort of took yep. coined that as an actual scientific field. Yes. Um, tell yep. us about that and how that's come about. What, how do you even feel about that, that you've really started a field? Well, I, I would probably credit Felice Jacka for having started the nutritional psychiatry because I probably wouldn't have called it nutritional psychiatry because that's probably giving too much credit to a group of people who still don't have a huge interest in this area, yep. which are psychiatrists. Yep. They haven't shown. There are yeah. some, yeah. some exceptions, but but for the most part, the, psych- the psychiatry has been very slow to 
to to recognize the benefits of using nutrients. Yeah, they're, um, quite, they're very uh, prescription-based. They are prescription-based. It's their training. I understand they come from a medical model, yeah. and they've been taught to think a certain way, and it's very hard when you've been indoctrinated into a certain worldview to, to kind of say, wow, this maybe this isn't as solid as I thought it was. Yeah. So, um, so yes, there's now this uh, international group, which is fantastic to have other know of other researchers who are doing similar work that you're doing, which is essentially looking at the role of nutrition or nutrients um, in the treatment of mental illness. So, you know, be that bipolar disorder, or in our case, we've done trials on ADHD and um, you know stress associated with earthquakes. You know, we've well, which is not a mental illness, um, but, but it's, a, it's a trauma nonetheless, it's and, a trauma. and it can go the wrong way, right? It sure can. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So, um, so it's it's exciting that the model that has prevailed for fifty years is being currently challenged and I, I think challenged quite well with data. It's not that it's changed any practice yeah. so far. Um, that's the depressing part of it is that you know how many trials do you have to do before the public health care system you know wakes up and goes we should we should um, do things differently. I mean yeah. again I bet you come across this all the time. Oh, yeah, I mean, well, are they I've, still Well I've given up on that frankly and I've decided that we just need to do it ourselves. Yes, and uh, I think I'm starting to go. I've been trying, you know, knocking on this door, going "Hello, listen," and and they don't want to open the door. They don't want to open their minds to a different way of thinking. Yeah. And that's, and I, and part of me is like you, kind of says, "Well, then we have to do it a different way." But then part of me gets grumpy about that because I pay tax dollars <laughs> to a system that is broken. That just doesn't seem right. I should be able to choose to yeah, use but, my tax dollars but differently. There's, but there's that old saying that, you know, first they'll fight you. you fight, uh, then they'll, they'll ignore, or they'll they'll ignore, ignore you. you and, and then it'll be their idea. Exactly. Yeah, that's so, right. So, so yeah, hopefully we're in stage I, two. I, I maybe sure, we'll get to stage three. Exactly. So, you know, I think you and I are, you know, the more I think about it, are on a very similar journey in different fields, but experiencing probably very similar um, levels of resistance. Yeah. Yeah. So th I think those fields are colliding though, right? Let's explore that because you've been quite focused on the micronutrients and a broad yes. spectrum. Yes. So tell us about the broad spectrum. Yeah. And then I'm really interested in when that, where you think, why there might be deficiencies. Yeah. Why there's doses that you need mm. and then and that might, have, how that might vary. Sure. Yeah, no, that's a, it, that's a big complex uh, question. Um, so let me see if I can unpack that. So, for, well, first of all, yes, we are using broad spectrum. So, and that's important. Yeah. Um, if you, as soon as you, you step away and you you look at the 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 making of a neurotransmitter like dopamine mm -hmm. or serotonin, it's not long before you realize that it needs a lot of cofactors along the way. And you also, I, I recognize macronutrients are important there too, yep. but you need things like zinc and you need magnesium and you need B6 and you need B12. And then you, so you just, you see that it doesn't make any sense to give any one single nutrient on its own. Yeah, right. But that has been the research for the last hundred years has been on this right, single nutrient the, strategy. Right, and even the macro stuff's gone that way because it's omega-3 fatty acids from fish oil or something, which yes. has some marginal effect. But the... the, the that's you know, it's gone that single nutrient. That's right, yeah. exactly. So it's but that's the science. I think that's partially driven by the scientific methodology. Yep. Is that we we want to manipulate one variable at a time. Mm. So when you start to manipulate several, it get, becomes complex very quickly. Yep. And so you try scientists tend to try to stay away from that because then you don't you think well what nutrient was it? And I say well that's the wrong question. It's not any one nutrient in there. It's the broad spectrum of nutrients. Right, uh, but as as you, as you view then because because if you look at the, 80% of what we're selling in our supermarket is ultra-processed yes. uh, rubbish packaged food. Yeah. Then presumably that's what we're eating as a society because that's what we're selling. That's right, yes. Yeah, so so thinking about the the why a broad spectrum, one of them, you're, uh, what you're identifying is that our diets are not adequately nourishing us, and that's very clear. So that would definitely be one piece of this um the, the puzzle. Um, and, you know, things like... Um, 
uh, not remineralizing your soils properly, mm. using uh, glyphosate on plants, which we know um, is a chelator and will take minerals, you know, make it yep, less yep, nourishing. Yep. Uh, effects of, of climate change, carbon dioxide, we know that that uh, makes plants grow much quicker and faster. You end up with more sugar and less nutrients. Yeah, so right. There's so so even, if, even if you moved away from just the packaged food and you were yes. eating whole plants and animals, our, our and, and current industrial farming would mm-hmm. marginalise your food quality. Exactly, yeah, right. exactly. That's an interesting point. And yeah. so there's all these environmental factors that can play a role in how nourishing your food is, even if you're eating a good diet. Yes. And some people will be fine with eating a marginal diet, and they won't have health effects. They might eventually have health effects, but mm-hmm. some people are really resilient. I mean, we know that, is that through starvation exper- experiments, or starvation, you know, natural um, observations of people who starve. There are people who just thrive in those environments mm. and they're probably genetically superior or, or, oh, they some, just, or they, different. They, their, envir- their, their evolutionary environment was one that was more like that. Exactly, they, exactly. So there are people who do fine in that type of, of environment. But what, what we wonder is whether or not people who struggle with mental health issues are fall on the other side of the spectrum and that they are more vulnerable to these changes in the nutrient content of food. Mm. So when you ask me about deficiency, I always get a bit kind of like, oh, I don't know if it's deficiency or it's deficiency relative to your metabolic needs. Mm. So, so again, some people might be fine with a, with not getting a really great amount of nutrients yeah. and they're, they're, they'll function fine, whereas other people are going to be more sensitive to that. And so, then it's also the is there stuff about bioavailability of those nutrients and those exactly, things as well. Exactly. There's all of those other issues that go alongside that. But the reason why I'm making a point of this is that some oftentimes I'll get people who will contact me and they'll say, oh, you know, I got my, my, my bloods done and all of my nutrients are normal, and oh, oh yeah, which means that they're normal compared to the average individual. Yeah. Um, and so my, my doctor has said, I don't need any additional nutrients. Yeah. Well, we've done research on this, and we've looked to see whether or not... Um, lo- so you'd expect then that people who come in with lower levels would do better yes. if that was the predominant thinking. Like, oh, so you'd get them at baseline, get those yes, levels. We've and, done and what the happens? Levels. That that is not a good predictor of getting well. Your huh? outcome, and even change, is not a good predictor. So even if your B12 level goes up, that doesn't necessarily mean that your mood improves. improves. Right. So So who knows? So so there's two there's, there's two things to explore there. Yes, Extra is here. First moderator of moderator and a mediator effect. Yeah. None of them are very exciting. But no. uh, but also And it might be that you just need bigger samples and we haven't looked at every nutrient level and some nutrients as you you'll know are maintain really tight homeostasis, so you won't see much variability anyway in your blood serum. So yep. you, maybe it's the measures that we're using. There could be a and whole also, host of also, problems. And also, who knows what the homeostasis in your blood is compared to um, yes. how it's actually ended up in, 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 in actual in your proteins tissue and in your tissues and exactly. that sort of things. Who knows yeah. what that is? We don't. Exactly. So yeah. we're at a very beginning place when it comes to that. And so I just wanted to say that because uh, I don't want to put people off trying nutrients because we've seen people who come in who look supposedly healthy yeah. in their nutrient levels. And granted, we haven't done the whole fleet of nutrients because we can't afford it. Yeah. But we've looked at the main ones that you would typically go and get your you know levels checked on. And people who come in with normal levels can still really benefit from the approach. So I just, right. I, I'm not a big fan of nutrient testing mm. because I it think... It doesn't tell you the answers. It, it, it's not going to tell you whether or not you're going to be someone who's going to respond. And also doesn't, it, it, I think what it does is it eliminates those people who are normal from... Yeah. from, from um, a possible benefit. From a possible benefit, exactly. Okay, and then you've got... You've got recommended daily intakes of micronutrients, oh, and then you've got the, you've got the blood levels of the reference ranges. How, yes. how do we even explore both of those in any meaningful right, way? Oh, I know. So RD, RD, RDA, um, your recommended dietary allowance. Is that what you're raising yes. with me? Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm not a big fan of of RDAs. Um, I think they are outdated. Yeah. They represent what might be an optimal amount of nutrient that you need for bone health. Yeah. Or for maybe heart health, possibly. Well, where do they even come from? 
I, I don't, I'm assuming that, the, I don't know the history of it, but I'm assuming it's a bunch of dietitians got together in the 1960s and came up with Yeah, well, that's, you know? that's more or less as I understand it from, from Karen Zinn and the U.S. Department okay. of Agriculture and that sort of thing. So I'm really nothing, just arbitrary. Arbitrary, yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you look at them and then you look at what they've said for children. I mean, this is where you think they must be arbitrary because they just do, a, they get an idea of what an adult needs and then they, they just do some kind of a calculation about, well, then that means that a child needs less. Oh, because they're smaller. Because they're smaller, exactly. And and actually, what I've learned is that, of course, is that when you go through certain growth spurts, yeah. like during adolescence yeah. or other times, your nutritional requirements are higher than your average adult. Yeah, right. And so to think that, to extrapolate downwards and go that kids need fewer nutrients and a lower amount of nutrients, it, do, is, it doesn't completely makes no, sense. No, it doesn't make any sense. And make any sense. So, but that's what's used and we have to fall, we have to adhere to those. Well, we don't adhere to them, but we do I, whenever I put an application to ethics, I always have to explain why we're giving the nutrients higher than RDA. Yeah. And and how, how much higher are you? What, and what sort of doses are we talking about? Yeah, it depends on the nutrient that we um, nutrient you're talking about. So, because some nutrient, what you, what you're, what we're less interested in is the RDA. What we have to be more focused on is the UL, which is the upper limit. And the yeah. upper limit identifies a level that is really conservative, where no known toxicity has occurred. Right. Okay. So that's the one that ethics committees are going to be. So you want to stick around that, or just under you that. do. You want to work between the RDA and the UL, right. and that's pretty much where we are operating. But with some exceptions, and that is that going back to this whole single nutrient approach, ULs have been de determined based on single nutrient studies. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. So give p people a whole bunch of zinc, what are you going to get? Yeah. Do you know what you're going to get? You're going to get a copper deficiency, right? Right. So the zinc UL is based on preventing a copper deficiency, oh. or folic, or or folic acid is is that level is controlled by preventing masking a B12 deficiency. So there's but that that's nonsensical and is meaningless when you're giving the nutrients in combination because we give copper with zinc yeah. and we give the B12 alongside. So yeah. you're not going to have a B12 deficiency occur because they get lots of B12. Yeah, right. Um, and in fact, you can, there's no UL for B12 because you can just keep taking it and there's no toxicity associated with taking B12, yeah. for example. So those ULs are 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 not that logical either and we sometimes go over them but for logical reasons yeah. if that makes sense so yeah. not that I I mean I, I haven't had anything to do with the developing of the formula we just test it okay yeah and then some people will say okay well and I think we've slightly explored this why wouldn't you just go for diet quality why don't you just yes, get these, why don't you get these uh, people on improved diets yeah. why do we have to do it by micro <laughs> why do we have to do it by pill what, yes. what do you think about that yeah um <laughs> The way I, I see our work fitting into the bigger space is that you have to remember where where we came from. So here I was in the early part of the century starting to think about doing the uh, challenging the paradigm that nutrition is relevant to your brain, which yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, even right. saying it, you just think, oh, my God, can you like, are we actually there where we have to? We have to. Keep saying to, that. We Why have to keep, say that, or that, yeah. that science doesn't think that this is this is um, is settled yet. That that nutrition is relevant to the brain. I mean, I would say that one's a fairly settled one. Well, because well, hang on, let's just deviate onto that quickly yeah. because the, this idea mm -hmm. that countries like New Zealand have serious mm. problems with with mental health at yeah. the pointy end, yes, with um, high rates of suicide and yeah. then everything that falls down under that. Uh, and no one discusses the role of I know and it wasn't and it didn't even end up in the report which you know nutrition was in the the mental health um, report to the government here yeah. um, or, or what did they call it I'm trying to remember the Maori name for it so um, so, so they what do you make of that though like uh, when hundreds of millions of dollars are getting spent and it's mainly on counseling how we yeah. how is that a solution it's not a solution, and I think that's that's certainly part of the big picture problem is that we keep thinking that we can counsel our way out of this problem mm -hmm. or that we can medicate our way out of this problem. And I think we've come to the conclusion, what was nice about that report, the report 
was that they did they did acknowledge that we can't medicate our way out of this problem, but I think they now think that we can counsel our way out of it. And, 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 and your can. view is that's futile? Uh, it's, I think it's completely futile because we just don't have a, a large enough workforce to meet the need. So but you've just had an expansion in your University of Canterbury I, training program, we, haven't you? Tell, we, me, tell me about that. We have. We're about to take more students next year, and I, I suspect that other country, other programs around New Zealand are going to do the same and thing. And what's the increase? Um, it'll be a couple of people probably th- at most because that's all you can – we can expand So it. how many do you have now? You've got a- We've got 12 a year, and so if we expand, it will go up to 15, 14 next year. Oh, well, that should solve the problem. Uh, yeah, another two clinical psychologists in three years' time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not – It's not. Uh, if you do the calculations, you go, we've got um, 3,000 psychologists registered in New Zealand. We've got 1,500 of those are clinical psychologists. That makes about a one in 312, one, one, one psychologist per 312 people who are struggling with a mental health issue. If you see the pop, it's about one in five, which is about a million people in New Zealand, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that is impossible. You could add in all the counselors. And so even then you might bring that ratio down to one in 150. But if you think about any psychologist can see between 60 to 80 people per year, then you realize you need to double the workforce. So we need to go basically from 3,000 up to 6,000. And if you're adding in another few, less than 10, you're, it's going to take us, I made the, sort of a rough calculation that I thought it might take us about two decades to get there. Right. to meet the current needs of our population. But by 2040, we're going to need, need more. more if we keep so, so th- ha- approaching the can, problem can you, this did way. I, did I hear correctly that first number that you mentioned, that there would be about a million people in New Zealand? Yeah, because it's one in five, oh, which oh. is about the population of the South Island. It's about 950,000. 950, oh, yeah. Gosh. Well, that's if you take this, you know, uh, you agree with the statistics. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. But I would say it's pretty strong. I think that's probably fairly accurate based on New Zealand health data. So based on questionnaires mm. that they give populations. So but you ha- asked me a question before that I think we got off topic. Oh, on, yeah, no, the t- the, we were back on, I'm just talking about why why not just whole food. Oh, that's right. Yes, uh, okay. Uh, okay. That's, okay. Yes, because that's a good one. You're not on, you're not on, you're not on uh, broad spectrum. Like, you just need to eat properly. Yes, absolutely. And so going back to this, so, so we're challenging a paradigm, which is that for 50, 60 years, we've thought the only way of treating serious mental health issues is with a drug, a drug that targets neurotransmitter, you know, just at the synaptic level, adjusts, you know, your one, levels. One small interference with human yes, homeostasis. Exactly. How's that going to grow for you? It's it, well, we know what happens, and your your brain adapts to it. Yeah. Um, and then you you need more and whole bunch, and then that, and then you end up with if you come off it, you end up with withdrawal. So there's a whole bunch of challenges associated with yeah. that model. But that's been the model that we've been bought into. We've bought into this. It's called the chemical imbalance theory. Yeah. There's no good data to support it, but that's what we've been sold. And and it's 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 luring. It sounds great. I remember learning about this approach. You know, when I went through my first degree in neuro, in, in neurobiology and thinking, wow, that is so cool. And it just it, it was a time of great optimism. And so we're th- now kind of going, oh well, that didn't work out as well as we thought. We've been increasing the number of people on on these medications. Thirteen percent of the New Zealand population is on an antidepressant, and we still have rising rates of mental illness. At po- some point, you kind of go. If this treatment was working so well, our rates of mental illness by now should be going down. Right. So, th- do you agree with the the idea that the medications SSRIs here, this selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, yes, and a placebo the randomized t- trial that they would be marginally more effective than placebo, it, although placebo is quite effective. Is that a summary? A fair a, summary. I think that's a fair summary of yeah. where that's at. And yeah. so yeah. then you, and if you're so, if and then you might be someone who goes, well, then I'm still willing to go for it. But what isn't unfortunately talked about as much in that informed consent process is the the risks associated with it. And I think yes. we've minimized the risks. Yeah. So that we've minimized minimized the side effects, but we've also minimized the um, long term effects. Right. And that. In the long term, things aren't really any better if we look at any class of medication. And in some cases, things are getting worse. So, uh, oh, and, yeah, yeah. and then it's, if you stop, and yeah. then if you stop your medication, yeah. then about half of people go through withdrawal, of which half of those experience it as severe. So, that means that it's very hard to come off of the medication. So, I think that if people mm-hmm. are told about the big story, about the whole full picture, then they might think twice about. The medication, they may still make the de- the, the decision, yeah. and there are people out there who will have been saved by medication, who will who yeah. will feel that their lives have uh, have improved dramatically as a consequence. 
but too many people are not getting better. Yeah, that's right. You made a really good point. And that, I actually first met you online as by just watching a TED Talk that you did. Yes. Um, which we'll just talk about in a moment. But I think a lot of what you're saying there is good. I'll, I'll link through to this so people can <laughs> see it. It's just, sure. it's just one of the most inspiring talks I've ever had. Ah. So uh, first of all, just tell us about that, even doing a TED Talk. So how do you even get the call up for that? And what <laughs> do you make it. of that? But can we answer the question about the, the nutrients? Oh, yeah. Yes, okay, yes, okay, okay, okay. Because okay. I'm, I'm like, um, you know, Oh, you jumped away from that. Yes. Sorry. Yes. And then I'll answer it. I can have you to talk about the TED Talk. Um, but just so, so, so just going back to this paradigm that we just talked about, yeah. which is that medications were the, the the cure, to to start to put nutrition essentially back on the map because it, you, our ancestors knew about this mm. and they knew how important nutrition was, but we've lost we we lost sight over the last you know fifty sixty years. So to put it back on the map, I think one of the essential things was to do randomized controlled trials that are really blind, mm. and you can't do that with dietary manipulation. No, you cannot. You're correct. So you can't. People know when they've been um, randomized to the fruit and veg- vegetable condition unless there's some way of <laughs> hiding your fruit. You know, you they no, know. No, you, you're not going to dress up your uh, you broccoli as a Twinkie. No, you can't do that. Exactly. Yeah. So, so you can't. That's the problem with the dietary intervention. One of the problems with the dietary intervention studies yeah. is that you can't. You can't mask it, and you. Do, it's harder to know about adherence or to the diet yeah. cha- change. There's a whole bunch of complexities uh, and true. my hat goes off to people who do that Whereas I haven't done it yes I'm looking at these I'll just yes. pick them up on um, uh, yes. Julie's desk which is a a big bottle of nutrients. Yeah. Much easier to get people to swallow that. Um, we've been very successful at getting people to adhere to it. We've done. We've collected lots of data on adherence. No problem. And so, and you can, and you can truly do a blind, blind it. A, a double blind trial, yes. and you've got the exactly. uh, someone else making the, the uh, these exactly. Things. And we, and it's it's randomized by a pharmacist. We just hand out the bottle. So we we're blind. The participants are blind. We've established that the blind works. Yeah. So there's a little bit of riboflavin, which is a B vitamin, in the placebo. So oh, so the urine change color changes. The, yes, oh, exactly. Very sneaky. Very exactly. Yeah. And so the, the, we've got vanilla sachets to mask any change in difference in odor. So we've, the the blind has been successful. I see where you're going here because because <laughs> then you're doing a proper pharmaceutical grade double placebo. Exactly. Trial. You got it. And, and so then and, it's and harder to argue. And if there is an effect of nutrients there, yeah, yes, see, I get it. Yes, then it's harder to argue with that. And and yeah. believe me, when we when I first published my first RCT, which was using the nutrients to treat eight, um, uh, symptoms associated with ADHD in adults, yeah. I, I, I must have gone through 10 journals. I got that rejected oh. from the gate, you know. The editor said this is of no interest. Even though we'd shown an effect, i have done it. <laughs> I'd, no, I'd, interest it was, to, no interest to the pharmaceutical companies. We're not, yeah. Our readers will not be interested in that. So eventually I got it published in a good, really good journal, British Journal of Psychiatry. Yeah. Um, but I had to appeal their first decision, which was to reject it. Yeah. But they'd reject it on grounds that were so ridiculous that I, I could and write what, what back. what were the grounds? Well, they said this is better for a child journal, which meant that they hadn't read it because it was done with adults. <laughs> right? Um, so there was that. They said it wasn't powered properly, and I said, well, we did do a power calculation, and you have published studies with this level of, of number of participants before. So I, uh, clearly that's not a criteria for entry into your journal. And the third one was that they said it wouldn't be of interest to their readers, in which case I said, well, that's up to the reviewers really to make that de- determination. So they reluctantly agreed that they'd send it out for review. And, and it was accepted. And then it was accepted eventually. Yeah. Wow. So, But it took a lot of that kind of this just knocking my head against the wall constantly of, of you know, whether it be funding agencies, whether it's ethics committees, whether it's you know the MedSafe, oh, you name it, everyone's opposed to it, and it's remarkable. Because it, it is demoralising, isn't it? As an yeah. academic, I've had to face this: that, that yeah. getting rejected, and and then even when you're not rejected, the 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 self-effacing demands and yeah. the and the bullying that they do to you is, exactly. is quite demoralising. It is demor- it, it is, and there are so many times where I go, I should just give up and go back to research that's safe. And by safe, I mean the research I did before getting in, involved in this whole nutrition area, which I said I walked into this completely naively, didn't know what was going to happen, was... Um, I, I would, you know, I might might have to try two journals to get yeah. something in, and uh, but it, this the, the the work was uninspiring. Yeah. It was not going to change the world. Yeah. Um, it was just telling us a bit more about ADHD and executive function and things like that. And yes, in, interesting 
possibly some relevance, but not going to make a difference to their lives in any way, whereas this actually makes a difference to their lives. And and, and so on speaking of that, I just want to get back to the TED Talk yes, thing. Yes, we that, could go that, there now. that spoke very powerfully to me, and I think it will to the people who are listening to this. Yeah. Because um, you're very clearly communicated there in a short time. Yeah. Um, what you felt was wrong with psychological medicine and psychiatric medicine. Yeah. You very powerfully mm. communicated what you felt about uh, the medical model. Yep. How, how did that kind. happen and how, <laughs> how, how do you find it? How, well, just tell us how the process you went through to do, to do such a great talk. Yes. Ex- well, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, Ted, you do know that it's got a flag on it, yeah. I assume, from Ted yeah. that says, uh, don't watch this for medical advice and the interface between oh, nutrition. Yeah, tell, and, so tell me about how did that ever come about? Because that's, oh that's more astonishing than ever. That is astonishing. I know. And that was heartbreaking when that happened because, it, well, how about we first start with the good news story, which yeah. was doing, being able to do a TEDx talk, because which it doesn't happen to anyone. Yeah. Um, you have to, as, a, as you know, as a scientist, to get onto a TED stage, you have to, there's, there's some a tech, tick boxes. You have to have a PhD. You have to work at a credible university. You have to have a peer-reviewed publications. Yeah. Um, there's somewhere you might kind of go, well, you have to, it has to be credible to other people in your field. And I would say, well, yeah. why does a TED talk have to be, yeah. well, why does it have to be believed by everyone in your in your field, yeah, yeah. especially if it's cutting edge. But anyway, yeah. that's yeah, one of the It pictures. has to be an idea worth spreading. Yes. So has it has to, to be a, appeal to the interest of the public. That's right. Um, and you have to be able to communicate. Communicate it. Yeah, but they don't seek you out for communication necessarily, although maybe that is part of the the the, 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 the vetting process. So essentially, uh, for me, all that happened was that I was on a plane to Sydney and sat beside this woman who... Um, you know, we both looked at each other, you know, and I didn't know who she was. And um, but it was an early six o'clock flight. We didn't talk to each other. And then we came back, and we sat. We both sat beside each other again oh. on the flight back from oh, Sydney. That's amazing. I know, amazing. <laughs> and that person was Kyla Colbert. Oh, yeah, I know Kyla. Yes, Kyla. Yeah. So, so we got. She looked at me, and she said, "Oh, you look a bit familiar." And then we got chatting, and I've been. I by then I'd been in the media a bit, and she's like, "Oh yeah, I've been thinking about you for." for going on because she's the curator of yeah. TEDx Christchurch yeah. and I've been thinking about you but I just don't think your work is ready and I was like I fair enough yeah we need to publish more but when we published that randomized control trial she contacted me and said you're ready for my stage and so that was in 2014 so that yeah. was and and it was just an amazing experience of being on I, I took full advantage I thought this is my one chance because yeah. It is regarded highly to get a TED Talk. Mm-hmm. Like it's, there people, the, you you move up a level in a way in terms of credibility, I think, yeah. when you have that kind of talk. And so you are taken more seriously. So I thought I have this one opportunity. I'm going to give it absolutely everything. And I did. I gave it everything. So yeah. when you see, the, the, hopefully the, the, that yeah, comes no, it's, across. It's, it's totally exciting. And also it's, it's, it's going to, I don't know if you've ever thought of this, but it, it's going to go on in perpetuity, right? You're going to be long gone, and your TED talk's still going to be sitting there. No, no, of course it will be. Yeah, Yeah, so that's cool. Oh, now, what about the flag on there? Yeah, that's that's an astonishing thing. I I, I saw that. Yes. um, And I've talked. I was going. Wonder why I can't even understand. I can't. Yeah. To begin to, in fact, so much so that I went and looked up every single paper that you had on there, which are all real, of course. Okay. And I was okay. just going, well, is there something wrong here? Yeah. That's yeah. what I was wondering. Is there some is she, yeah. mis- is she misrepresenting the, the, the data? That's all I could think. Of, so that's yeah. weird. Yeah. Yeah. But but you're not. No, not at all. Um, and I have I have argued with Ted. So this so this is where you have to you you probably appreciate this, but some of your listeners might not. Yeah. Is that TEDx is independent of TED? TED yeah. is the big parent organization. Yeah, and, and these are independently run but sort and of they're franchise independent, things. Exactly. Yeah. But TED has influence over the TEDx t- um, talks and are, they're the ones who come along and put the flag on. And so, did they tell you about that? Or? Um, only after it was done. So apparently someone from the medical community, this is all I've been told, complained about the talk that people would look at it and they would quit their medications and that they would start nutrients and that I hadn't done enough to warn the audience that it was new, it was emerging, which I do in that talk. It's astonishing. Yes, but that that was enough to get a flag on it. So they claim they watched it and they cl- they also, they, they wrote to Kyla and they said, you know, don't take, you know, make sure you don't bring these kind of pseudoscientists onto your stage. And it was like, she was she was amazing and, and wrote back and said, you do realize that she's published randomized controlled trials in really good journals, high impact fact journals, all of that. And we sent all of this information to them. Didn't make a difference. 
they had made up their mind to put keep a, a flag on it. We managed to get it mod changed in wording, but the current flag is still obnoxious to and and a personal attack on me. And discredits you. And it discredits me uh, exactly. Uh, and what is such a powerful tool? Exactly. So yeah. so this didn't happen until I had hit eight hundred thousand views. Oh, is, so, it, is, that what, is that what it's up to? And what, what's that up to oh, now? One point one. Oh, yeah. My gosh. Yeah. So it's done, and and it and. To, you know, it, no. You know, what is the the phrase that um, you know all publicity is good publicity yeah, because yeah. it went up another two hundred thousand because of this flag. So mm. it did. You know, it suddenly jumped in its views. People yeah. want to watch a talk that Ted thinks you shouldn't watch. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> so, so that's a, you know that you that's and I and and the comments on the on the talk have been a lot of them have been really supportive and yeah. saying why did Ted you know flag this talk? This is fantastic work and you know I I've published. You know, now at this stage, I've published in, you know, Lancet Psychiatry, JAMA. Uh, you know, I'm trying to think of some other, you know, fairly well well respected journals. So it's not like I'm I'm a, a newbie, new to the field. New no. to the field. Yeah. Um, and th we've got, you know, these these publications are well cited and well respected. They're done, as you said earlier, like a drug trial. So it's remarkable that they think they need to put a flag that says that the the research and the, the um, between nutrition nutrition and mental illness is still a new emerging area of study right so, so please go to your medical doctor and it's like but you know the medical doctor hasn't helped yeah. why are they using this and and you think about Ted as being spreading new ideas and about being innovative and yet they're telling you to go back to that person who hasn't helped you yeah and you can imagine should we just pick out one so we pick out a, a psychotic illness where you get um, yeah. your, your prescribed clomazepine which has yeah. um, a lot of massive are, metabolic effects will probably take 10 years probably, probably you, take a decade off your life because you'll get diabetes exactly, or cancer or and something and you're going to gain weight very quickly yeah. so there's a whole a host of challenges and the, and the outcomes aren't great so it is sad that that to see that side of Ted and so as a con and as you know my I've got a, a journalist as a husband yeah. and so he did some great digging around and found that Merck is a sponsor for Ted oh and Merck makes guess what antidepressant venlafaxine so is that the reason I don't know Right, I can't. They, they. W I always asked, and they wouldn't tell. So they wouldn't say, "Did that have an influence?" But you know, as I was saying before, mm -hmm. we know that the farm, the the um, pharmaceutical industry has played a role in in um, the publication of findings on yeah. drugs, and that's why it's been so important that that we. I'm completely independent, and if you've got a drug company as a sponsor giving Ted money, yeah. You've then got a conflict of interest. They have a conflict of interest. And I, I was just so disappointed. And, you know, I had held Ted's in such high regard, those talks in such high regard. But for them to potentially cave to their sponsor, I don't know, well, might not well, have well, anything well, to do with it. They well, felt yeah. absolutely they needed to warn the public that they shouldn't think about nutrition as being relevant to their yeah. <laughs> health. Yeah. I mean, what a great message to carry send on to the public. Ca carry, carry on with, on. Kind of with Yeah, you. I mean, in the end, they also said, you know, this talk is, out is outside of curatorial guidelines. The only thing that they felt that they could get me on in the end was that I oversimplified legitimate studies. So that's what I, I am, it says that on there right now. I wanted them to take off the, I, I don't mind if they put a flag on, like, you know, go talk to your doctor. Yeah. That's fine. But they personally attacked me with saying I, was, I, I spoke outside yeah. of curatorial guidelines. And given that I'd worked so closely with Kyle, Kyla on this talk and every word had been fact checked, yeah. she doesn't let you go on that stage without that. Yeah. And so for them to, that, that the only thing that they could find me guilty of was oversimplifying legitimate studies you kind of go okay well that's okay but seriously what ted talk isn't oversimplified in the 18 minutes that you get yeah and uh, is there going to be a day when you wear this as a badge of honor yeah i don't know i don't know i mean I, it's still i i'm because i'm sort of i'm sort of I'm oh so, you I'm want so, you I'm, want one I, too no, no i don't want a flag but i i'm 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 thinking it's a badge of honor no oh, well thank you <laughs> because I did go through a lot. Like it was, I was angry. I was in, and and part of me was was shamed by it by this oh. public. Well, it's a, it's something that. Yeah, here's a great it, talk that I'm really proud of, but at the start, don't take it seriously. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so, okay, yeah. so it was it was something that I then couldn't feel as proud of because it had this 
this um statement from the big brother saying you know there's there, there's something wrong with this talk and i you know having worked so hard on it and being so proud of it it was yeah it's tainted it for me unfortunately but you've still got through to at least 1.1 million people we to hopefully make their own judgment. exactly and we Mind do you, they're not all one person because i've watched it several times <laughs> and i think <laughs> i think there are other people like that too <laughs> so i'm sure there are a few but i i struggle to believe that 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 will in itself get it up to 1.1 million yeah yeah that's true um, <laughs> no, but no, we, no. it does it generates a lot of um emails uh to the lab and mm. i now have my graduate students help me reply to emails because i couldn't manage it on my mm. own and so we've got a system going. We reply to every single public email we get. I'm sure you're similar in that sense. You probably get contacted all the time. I don't know how you manage well, it. Well, I think the difficulty is uh, deciding when you're giving actual advice that falls outside of the yeah. scope of practice that you'll be comfortable with. You know, like, yeah. So we get them quite often in the nutrition stuff around uh, blood tests that people get from their doctor, yeah. you know, like triglycerides, yeah, and we like don't. cholesterol, or like glucose, mm-hmm. what do I make of that, and what should they be? And yeah, and we don't, but we don't yeah. reply to, we, we reply with just a general information, yeah. and and pr- with a kind of like a question-answer yeah. kind of thing, yeah. so we've got this document that we send to anybody who asks us, and so that answers the questions around, well, what nutrients did you study, and we can then give the information within the context of other nutrient formulas that yeah. have also been studied, so that we're not looking like we're, we're just say this is the formula that you need to take and there's no other formula. Not at all. We're studying an idea that nutrition is relevant to the brain. You have to use a formula to use yeah. it. It happens that I the we we call, I I was introduced to the formulas that were developed by these Southern Alberta families. Yeah. Um, they've been great companies to work with because they don't have anything to do with our publications. They don't direct us in any way. They just give the nutrients and a matching placebo for free, and then their hands hands off. Yeah, so cool. Cool. so it's been a, a you know positive experience. We then f- keep finding benefits. So it's like well sometimes. I think, oh, well, I should change formulas and test something else. And, and, and we have. We've worked, you know, we've looked at other formulas as well. But we have the biggest effects with this. Yeah. So why would you kind of muck around with that? And so end? where's the field going? What's going to happen in this yeah. field? Yeah. Um, hard, to, hard to know. I mean, I, I'm hoping that there'll be this one day of this tipping point. I'm always waiting for that tipping point of where, and maybe you're waiting for this one too, is where everyone kind of goes, oh, yeah, nutrition, of course. Of course, nutrition yeah. is relevant to your brain, yeah. and that we Every, all, everyone knows that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And so, <laughs> and then I can pack up and do something completely different. I don't know what it's going to be, but meanwhile, we do have a lot of studies that are going. We are trying to um, you know, one. One thing that it's, I think is going to be really important for any treatment for the future for mental illness or for mental health or well-being is that it's got good reach and it's scalable and it's affordable. Yeah. And th- so those are the three criteria that I think about. And so we are trying to, to, to design studies where we can reach more people. Um, so then you're using, you know, I know you're way far further ahead than I am on this, but using apps and um, using digital technology, yeah. not having to work with people face to face, doing a lot more through texting. So smaller interventions, mm-hmm. bite sized interventions. Yeah. You don't need to see people for an hour in that kind of traditional oh, model. Yeah, right. We want to move away from from that. Maybe doing a lot more. Of, you could you could combine co- some of those online therapy programs, like yeah. you know. Um, Does psychology ever do anything with um, people who that have success through a program, then coming in as a coach? Uh, uh, the next thing like as mentors and that sort of thing is that something that ever happens is that has that ever been I'm not thought? sure what you're thinking of. well it's like well, we, we do it in diabetes right yeah. so, so you get get some guy coming in fact there's a guy I know and um, he won't mind me using his name because he's pretty uh, popular in uh, uh, Joseph uh, Finnau in uh, uh, Mungary okay uh, big man he was over 200 kilos mm-hmm. he had uh, type 2 diabetes his yeah. wife had recently died of Cancer in mm-hmm. their late thirties. Mm-hmm. Six kids. Two of them are non-verbal autism. Right. Um, he was on every conceivable metabolic medication. He he yep. got onto a sort of a lower carb keto approach. Sorted out his diabetes. Got himself down to near 100 kilos off all yep. medications. Yep. Now feeds his family. The kids' autism's resolving. Yeah. Uh, but his thing was he now works in the in the Turiki Medical Centre in primary care as yep. a as a as a coach. Great. A community sort of yeah. group. So he'll come in and work with people in a yeah. similar 
situation. Yeah, Does that I, have been a mental health? Well, I think they're, I mean, the government is moving towards that with the introduction and the, or they're starting to throw around an idea of developing a new um, sort of a lower level psychologist. Yep. Not That's probably the wrong term because I wouldn't call them lower level, but just not as, they don't need to have the same level of training as a clinical psychologist. And they're going to call them like um, PWPs, well-being counselors. Oh, yeah. I think something like that. Yep. I can't, that doesn't amount to PWP or at all but <laughs> a well people working with people I don't know but there's that I got the W but I can't remember where the other two are but the idea being that they will have a basic one year uh, training post uh, an undergraduate degree in psychology and that they will be that workforce for the mild end yeah. and they will go into GPs, I suspect, into primary care. Yeah. So that's a mo- that is a new model that has come as a consequence of the mental health review. Okay. And so there maybe that sort of fits in a yeah, little bit with what the, you're yeah, describing. Yeah, that's right. Because yeah. I think there's... But a, I think we need to go there because as I said before, we just aren't going to we can't it's too expensive it's too hard it takes too long to and it's how long does it take to train a clinical psychologist it depends on what country you are the shortest and the, and the longest the shortest i i did the shortest i su- assume it's places like australia and new zealand yeah. and that is seven years so that's four year undergrad and yeah. then plus three years for clinical psychology training in canada in canada it took me 11 years oh, my yes yes and that's yeah. and that's the minimum because we have to do an undergraduate degree and then the the, it's a master's PhD level for most provinces, yeah. although not all. And this is the same in the States. And then once you finish your PhD, you still have to do another thousand hours of supervised practice as a postdoc. Yep. So post PhD wow. in order to finally license. So, and you have to do exams. So it's just, it's, uh, it was horrible. It's, it's a long time. It's a long time. It was, a, you know, I, I, I don't complain about it. I love university. I've stayed at university, so I've never left. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just one of those people who just loved university so much. I just got an academic job <laughs> and still here. So, um, but it is a long time, but I don't think it's necessary. Yeah, right. I don't, I think in terms of being able to work with most people, you don't love, need that level of of expertise, um, because most of where you're training that you that ex- is is on the, your job on the yeah. job of getting experience and learning. You don't yeah, need right. to stay in school forever. Okay, so now I've got my normal yes, five questions. Five that questions. I, that yes, I'd like, so I heard. that I'd like to ask you mm-hmm. if I may. Go for it. So first, Julia Rutland. Yes. <laughs> what yes. what what's good about the health system? Yes. Um, okay, so I think that there are some good things about the healthcare system. If you were to get an acute illness, um, or if you had an acute injury, like if you broke your leg, yeah. uh, or if you, I'm trying to think of an acute illness. Can you think of any? I guess if you had, ah, uh, you, you got an infection, or an you infection, got, you got or you meningitis. got meningitis, or sepsis, or yeah. something like that. Then I think our healthcare system is very. Um, uh, competent and be able to deal with those acute yeah. problems. You would rather be there than at home by Exactly. Yourself. You definitely are happy about antibiotics in those circumstances. Yeah. And where oh, where we don't do so, can I go for yeah, the yeah. next so one? Okay, okay, so the next one. So, so, yeah, so I think it? we do well on acute. <laughs> um, where I think we're falling behind is in the uh, prevention and chronic illness. And that's clear because you just look at the statistics and yeah. it's going up and you have and you think about the aging population and then just an increasing number of people who are obese in, in not just New Zealand, but internationally, the problems with diabetes. I mean, these are chronic, very costly health conditions mm-hmm. that we are so inadequately d- addressing currently in our healthcare system. Yeah. And the same would be true about mental health. I mean, and it's just... Y- uh, there'll be pockets of people who do really well yeah. who, and are treated very well and can recover from these illnesses. But you just, it's again, what I said before, you just look at the statistics and you think oh, if the treatments were really working, we wouldn't have an escalating health care crisis. And we can't afford it. We just can't afford it's it. Unless people are it? really willing to substantially increase their taxes. We can't afford it. And even then, yeah, because we, we do treat do a lot of sick people and do very, invest very little on Exactly. I mean, we have a sickness model. So we're not invested in prevention. We're not invested in uh, ensuring that people know about healthy eating or, well, I I think there's some good messages around 
around that, but probably not enough. Yeah. Uh, we need to do more in schools. We need to do more resilience work. Yeah, and well, even if you go to a hospital, their food's, the food supply the f- is... Exactly. The food is uh, is less than adequate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, definitely. And so what about you? What do you do? What do I do? For your, um, for your health. For my health. I, do, I think I, I, I think. I do. Because you look healthy. I, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's good. You even look slightly tanned, which is astonishing to me because I'm in Christchurch. And frankly, and it's outside, it's, it's, well, it's not just raining. Yeah, it's actually I think that's quite my cold. olive skin. Yeah. I don't think I'm tanned because it's been, I've been indoors and not, not out in anywhere special. Um, so what do I do? I, well, I obviously, I... I think diet is essential and important component yeah. of, of of wellness. And for me, it's not complicated. I don't um, follow any restricted type of plan yeah. other than I don't eat processed foods or I limit massively and it doesn't happen very often. Right, because that's like quite a lot of the food supply, right? Exactly. So, uh, so we generally eat, you know, fresh food. Real food. Yeah. Um, I'll I'll eat meat. I'll as you know prefer if it's um, you know we've got treated well. It's treated well yeah. exactly. Um, so I'll I'll eat across the food groups. Yeah. yeah but definitely. Um, so you're fully omnivorous. I am. And you yeah. go for a, what I would call a low human interference diet. That's what I, that's what yeah, I try no, to achieve. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, so that's the food side. Anything else? Food side. So. Um, uh, we learned a lot about stress and nutrients after the earthquake and mm-hmm. in being in Christchurch, we've had a lot of stress over a long period of time. And so one thing that I do know from our research is that we get very quickly depleted in B vitamins. Yep. So I do supplement with nutrients in order yep. to try to ensure that I can cope well. And I think so it's of, of, of the broad substantial spectrum broad spectrum nutrients. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, so that not in the doses that we use in our clinical studies because I I don't have a psychiatric disorder so I'm so what, fortunate a quarter, a quarter dose or half about dose? a quarter of yeah. the dose that we would use yeah. normally yeah. in the in our studies yeah. and that's what we found in our earthquake studies to be absolutely adequate in terms of helping you um, manage ongoing stress right and but without any particular uh, major issue. No, that's right. Oh, yep. that's interesting. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. yeah, yeah. Right. yeah so, cool. l- so I, I listened to our our research. Our research oh, showed oh, that. Oh, I must. Do, I might start just trying some of that. You, you yeah. could if you. I mean, B vitamins. There's a lot of research yeah, yeah, on B vitamins and yeah, stress yeah, for sure. Yeah. So uh, exercise. Um, oh, I there's a bicycle sitting there. There, there is a bicycle that's it's got a flat tire. As you also might tell your <laughs> listeners, <laughs> I do pump, but there's a pump there, so I do pump it up when I need it. So it gets pumped because it just it needs to be fixed, and I don't know. I haven't. In order to fix it, I have to take it on a car, and you know, yeah, it just too, has. It's all, it's all too much. So pumping it works for sh- for journeys around the university. Yeah, well, I, I spent my entire childhood riding a bike with the same flat tire. Oh no! You, know, way. you only get a limited time. You'd have to even stop mid ride and pump it and up. pump it up. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that this is pretty much like. And I bought this this bicycle a week before the earthquake, <laughs> and so it's been useless because it's a it's a road bike and. And after the earthquake, there the roads, were, the so roads were terrible. And every time I get a flat tire because of the the nails and things on the road. So it's been, it's not my favorite bike, but it's there. Um, I have an e-bike and that I try to ride. I make an absolute you know commitment to at least once a week. But this over the last week, I've, I've ridden it three times yeah. to and from work. Yeah. I am 18 kilometers from work. So it's a... And um, 1.6 oh, kilometers right. up a hill, yeah, yeah. so it's a, a it's about a, an hour and a half round trip. Oh, that's cool. So that's, that's quite as exactly clear the brain and, exactly, yeah. and it's it is and it's you know it, they are still I I am a big fan of e bikes. Yeah. It's a, enabled me to do that, whereas before it was it would take an hour and a half just to get home, and it's you, I've got two kids, and yeah. you just it couldn't. How I fast couldn't is it? How it. fast does it go? Well, it's limited at twenty-seven kilometers per hour. Yeah. So the most I can really get it up to is about. But 30, you can even 31. go at this speed up a hill, can you? No, yeah. no, no. It's it's one you have to. It's one of those ones that you have to pedal in order oh, okay. for it to work. Yeah. So up a hill, I'm usually going about thirteen kilometers an oh, okay. hour. Because I got passed the other day by an e-bike. I, I, it must have been in way more <laughs> than twenty-seven. Yeah, so, ones there that are some that have been jigged. Uh, and to go much faster. Yeah. But that's technically supposed. I think that's illegal. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're supposed right. to only go to a maximum of twenty-seven. Right. Because I'm always astonished when those people just yeah past they me. they do, and I'm not one of those. <laughs> no. Uh, so I'd say an e-bike definitely has been an amazing addition in my life. Um, I um, do regular yoga. 
So yep. that'd be an, definitely another piece of my health r- routine. Um, I have wonderful meditative baths. Yeah. Which are oh yeah, um, that, uh, like, just deep breathing and clearing the mind in yes, the bath. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, I, that's I never met anyone who said they do that. I do that all the time. Oh, okay. That's my favorite <laughs> thing. Yeah, yeah. I don't, oh, I've never, to, never told anyone about that. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, yeah. No, so it's a good, good place to do it, right? I would say that's part of my 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 routine, my yeah. my wellness routine. Yeah. Um, I get a massage once a month. Yeah. Which is again part of my. That's been so important. Just that part of. I've had this, you know, some of the things that we've talked about um, in this interview, you've, you know, have been very stressful. And so just having yeah, the, yeah, yeah just chilling, get chilling yeah. and, and being preventative, being yeah. preventative. It's like, it doesn't matter how good yeah. my life is going at the yeah. moment. I have that massage. It happens regularly. Okay. So the thing about this is also so perfect. So what, surely you're not perfect. What, I'm not what doesn't perfect. go well? No, what, it doesn't what, what go would well. you rather do better sometimes? Oh, or what doesn't? What I think would... you can always exercise better. You can always, um, oh, another thing that I do well on is sleep. Yeah. Definitely like that. You cannot compromise my sleep. It's got to be eight hours at that, least. Seen, so so is, that, is that a technique in modern psychology? Hmm. What, making sure you sleep well? Well, I just think a, it's an and, and, thing sleep no, no, but, but but in, in terms of you know, you're a psychologist working mm-hmm. in therapy, yep. ha, is sleep often used? Um, yes. Sleep better? Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, people, yeah, psychologists will talk about sleep, yeah, definitely, okay. as part yeah. of their yeah, right. general discussion, okay, yeah, and, and making sure that people are so are, they're comfortable doing that, but not necessarily going into diet. That's right, that's yeah, you, isn't yeah, it? you did raise that at the beginning. I think people are, I think they just fear getting it wrong and I think there are some r- simple messages that you mm, can get yeah, right yeah. it's it's when it's when you complicate it with all of these um, you know specific diets like you know the ketogenic diet or um, you know the what, you know a, a, veg- well, I don't know a vegetarian but eat plant based diet those become I wouldn't want I would or an elimination diet where yeah. you're taking certain food groups out yeah. in order to try to determine what you might be allergic to yeah. I wouldn't feel comfortable about talking to people about no, that no. I wouldn't right. know. I don't yeah. have the level of expertise to do that. Yeah. But I do feel that I have an adequate knowledge about nutrition to be able to say, you know what? If it's something that you don't, your grandmother doesn't recognize, maybe you shouldn't yeah, eat yeah, that. Yeah, the so, Michael, Michael yeah, stuff is good. So what don't I do well on? I would say um, ter- uh, not. Ter- I'm, I'm not great at turning work off. Yeah. I think a lot about work, but then yeah. I love my work. So yeah. that's hard to kind of say, is that a good thing so or a bad you, thing? So do you check emails after? I check emails terribly. Oh, my gosh. I'm I'm good at replying emails. And we do. Because I, I emailed you last night, so I had to change the time, and yeah. I think you might be back at about nine thirty. Well, there you go. That's, <laughs> there you know, you caught me. So um, I do, I do check emails. I do reply to emails, especially if it's. I think I can. Oh yeah, this is easy. I'll be able to because it it gets. You will have the same problem. Is that your inbox soon becomes overwhelming? Yeah, and it's and, like and that's not a good you, feeling, is it? No, and I that so I'm pro- I, I I feel like okay, that's I can I can email you back because that's going to take me. 10 seconds and, then and it's done it's done and then I can delete your email so then my inbox feels a bit more manageable but that's something I could be, do better but then do you, do you have an, an, an inbo- in, inbox anxiety you know when you go to yes, uh, you come back from three right. hours of doing something else and it's just like <laughs> bring a full screen know, and stuff and exactly. it's like oh my god it is hard I find the email is, is definitely a hard one um, I think that we can you can end up uh, social media can absolutely become this horrible warp of a virus you know just you just end up going down so many rabbit holes yeah. and before you know it you've been yeah. surfing the internet for far too long yeah how do you do you with the with your kids with that oh, it's that one's a hard one because they're teenagers and you can't tell teenagers very easily what oh, to great. do oh, and great. they and the problem is is that they need their you can't just say i'm banning your computer because they have to do their homework on their p- computer and so they, they can always say well, but mom i've got all this homework to do yeah, you right. can't take the computer away so it's a hard one i would say i think that we try to um, make sure that they get out. <laughs> they, <laughs> they are active, and they are active boys, yeah, so yeah. they do participate in sport. Yeah. And uh, But that's something that I think is every parent can struggle with is around that I, internet I thing. With that. I, I yeah. struggle with that. That and school lunches I struggle with. Okay. <laughs> we have them making their own school lunches. Uh, well, they I've done do. that. It doesn't end that well, though. Oh, just it. okay. Well, then we've done a, a we, better job. We've, we've done, done a better, better job. job. We, I don't know what we've we did because yeah. one of my one of my kids t- said to me the other day, you know, mom, other people don't make their lunches, and I was, and so why do I have to? I'm like, 
Well, that's not our problem. And yeah, keep you're, you're going to make your lunch. I, I'm not, you know, we've taught you how to do it, and you're you're not going to start getting away with that one now. And so he grumpily went off no, and made his lunch. But he did, he, they do try from time to time. Uh, I've, I've been in a, a school. I was doing some work at my boys' high school yeah. recently, and it was at the the class went into the morning recess, and we just kept them there for a moment, and they pulled out their morning tea. Yeah. It was astonishing. Right. It was just no. uh, beige refined. Yeah. No, I, I'd say these are, they are better. Yeah. They could be even better, but yeah. um, there's, again, there's only, you, you, you think, okay, well, we're getting it closer to right than wrong. Yeah, 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 that's right. Pir- yeah. That's all parenting. Isn't yeah, it? exactly. Yeah. So, um, what else do I, so, yeah, screen time is definitely one. Not ex- You can always do better there. Um, I think, uh, t- yeah, turning off. Probably yeah. How much would you work in a week? I don't know. I mean, I, I leave at a reasonable hour. Um, I usually leave around five, yeah. but then I but then as you know, I'll, I'll <laughs> reply to emails yeah. later on. So, um, what, so it's hard to know because and you what don't. What counselors work right? Because yeah, when you're reading something that's interesting and that's to do with I mental know, health, what, exactly. Or, nutrition, or if I'm watching a movie and it's relevant to mental, you know, it's like was that work or was and so that 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 um, division between my personal life and your professional life is blurred as an academic. Yeah, I think that's that's the problem. So to be able to say, uh, you know, certain hours, I can't can't quantify it mm. exactly. I mean, I, I'm I'm literally in my office about forty hours a week. Yeah. Um, never come in on weekends, yeah. so that's a, a you know Good pretty s- s- clear rule I've got. But then I might I might end up working at home if yeah. there's stuff that I just feel so overwhelmed with and I just kind of get caught up on. Holidays is something else that you need to do. We definitely and you do that. Yeah, we do. Oh, good for you. Definitely. And so, what would you holidays. say to other people as just take home message from this podcast? What, oh what would you say gosh. about their health? What would, what would, what would you, you just you know? I think, rat, rat, yeah, rat. I mean, I think that just that gradual shifting to away from processed food is you can't go wrong. Um, I think being prepared, you do need to be doing a little bit of forward thinking around snacks is, mm-hmm. that, I think, a downfall for many people. So being prepared with something easy. I, I think nuts are really yeah, good. Yeah, I agree one. with that. Yeah. Um, so I always have nuts by my desk. Um, you're you looking, you're you looking you at, did, I did no, offer you did, you did offer me nuts. I did. Yeah. I did say, did you want, and you said no, you no, had no, your I'm lunch. No, 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 I'm good. I'm on a, I'm on a, um, Fast. I'm on a 21 day challenge okay. where I'm having no snacks because it's my downfall is snacks, right? Oh, That's, so that would have been yeah, tempting. If, if you were asking if me I my just weakness, put them right yeah, here. you should have done that because then I'd lose points oh. on this, you see. And <laughs> right. It's all about the points. Well, then maybe I should get them out now and <laughs> no. just see what, and just tempt you. Have no. them sit there. And they've got, they've got the, the tamarind sauce on this, so they really taste good. Oh, oh yeah. You're killing me. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, nuts. Um, so, thinking about snacks, um, I think. If figuring out how to incorporate your exercise into your day rather than seeing it as something separate, yeah. that's why I commit to the trying to uh, to um, bicycle to work. Because it would take you half an hour to drive home anyway, exactly. right? Yeah, is that, is yeah. That right? so it's only an extra. I always say to us, it's only an extra 10 minutes for coming to work and it's an extra 20 minutes for going home because of the health. Yeah, right. So that's not that's that means I'm only investing a half an hour and an to hour get an hour and, hour and a half of exercise. Yeah. So that is it doesn't yeah, I, always I, I work. I love the way you're thinking there. But that is the way I've always thought is that you if you can incorporate your exercise into your daily routine, yeah. then you're more likely I think to do it. So yeah. I go up and down the stairs. I never take the lift. So yeah. there's and I'm on the fourth floor. So that means you get a, quite oh, a bit. Oh, I should of have done that. You, you put on the instructions for me though. To take I the know lift. I did. There was two choices for you. One is you could take the stairs, and if you took the lift, there were. Oh. Oh, but I didn't, you even, didn't I, I, read yeah, it. No, I didn't read it fully. <laughs> we gave people the option of taking the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Men are, you're going to go back to that I'm one. I'm going down the go. stairs. She was right. Yeah. She was right. She said that. Uh, so that's probably, is that, I don't know. Is that, what I think else? We're, I think sleep. We're, I think, I think don't compromise your sleep. Don't compromise. Don't ever compromise your sleep. So don't ever, you know, that again, thinking about university, I never did all nighters. I couldn't understand how people could do them. Just don't. And look at you, PhD. Professor with no all-nighters. No, <laughs> never. Yeah, never. Okay, so that's not just a single all-nighter. So you can do it yeah. without an all-nighter. Cool. Yeah. Well, Julia, thank you. You're welcome. Pleasure. It's fun. And that's it. Thanks for listening to the Flip and Health podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Precure. Prevention is cure. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like and subscribe. If you know someone who could benefit, please share it with them. Together, we can change medicine for the better. Change medicine for good. Good.